Okay, it is a great pleasure to have with us on the monthly colloquium of the Hellenic Astronomical Society, uh, Dr. Sotiria Kotopoulou. Uh, Sotiria did her undergraduate studies as well as her uh, master's degree at the University of Athens. And then she moved a bit further north and uh, went to Munich when she, where she did her PhD uh, with uh, some very well-known people, uh, Mara Salvato is the one I'm referring to in AGN classification, as well as someone who is called uh, Professor Hasinger. And uh, then uh, she completed her PhD in 2012 and then moved to the University of Geneva in Switzerland as a postdoc. And then she had a prestigious Swiss National Science Foundation fellowship which gave her the opportunity to move further north to uh, Northern UK to Durham University, where she was there for a couple of years. And since 2019, she is a vice chancellor fellow at the University of Bristol, moving south where the, all the action is in the nice weather. So it is a great pleasure to have uh, Sotiria with us. And uh, she's gonna talk to us about uh, the detection of active supermassive black holes in the next generation of imaging surveys. And I should mention actually that uh, as it will become obvious from her talk, that uh, Sotiria is heavily involved uh, in uh, Euclid and she's leading a substantial part of the very difficult effort to make science out of uh, all this wealth of data that will be coming down eventually. Sotiria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vasily. It's really a pleasure to be here and I'm really happy to see so many known names. I would have preferred to see faces, but uh, such is life. Uh, yes, today I will talk to you about my work and the work of my group uh, here in Bristol. And as Vasilis mentioned, we are very heavily involved in Euclid, so be prepared for a lot of that. Now, I, I'm sure everybody's going to agree in this room that probably the most major uh, open question we have these days in astronomy has to do with cosmology. What is dark matter and what is dark energy? It's quite embarrassing really, only about 5% of the visible matter um, uh, is uh, what would make up 5% of the entire energy density of the universe, and the rest is dark, either dark matter, about 27%, or dark energy. My personal opinion would be that the second very open uh, and embarrassing question would be what is the role of supermassive black holes in galaxy evolution? Uh, and it's something um, I will go into details uh, further on in the talk and we can discuss um, together if you want after the, the talk. In order to answer both of these questions, we need of course very large data sets and Euclid was designed in particular to map the dark universe. So everything from the design of the telescope to the analysis of the data uh, was created uh, with uh, this question in mind, how to derive very precise cosmological parameters. So perhaps you, you very well know is that um, Euclid is, a, is an ESA mission, is a space telescope that should be launched soon, uh, we hope. It is a collaboration of 17 countries with more than 2000 active members and nine data centers across Europe. Uh, Euclid is going to have an impeccable spatial resolution, uh, both in the optical and the near infrared, which is comparable that with the resolution we have currently from the Hubble Space Telescope but we're going to map the majority of the extragalactic sky. We're going to map something like 15,000 square degrees. I have been a member of the Euclid mission since uh, 2013 when I joined the University of Geneva. Uh, and since, since then, um, I have managed to work uh, my way through the collaboration. I'm co-leading two groups, um, one on the classification working group, with re which relates to the core science of Euclid um, in the organizational unit of photometric redshifts and the other one uh, relates to the legacy science and has to do with the exploitation of the uh, data set um, on the type one and type two AGM. Just a very brief um, advertisement on what is the cosmology we're after with Euclid. Um, we are going to do galaxy clustering and, and with the hope of measuring baryon acoustic oscillations, uh, which is an absolute spectacular thing even to imagine that this thing first of all exists and then we can measure it. So you remember that when the universe was, was really small, the, the photons and the baryons were coupled and any fluctuation in that uh, primordial baryon photon fluid would travel with the speed of sound. 
once the universe expanded enough uh, for the photons to decouple, the photons were able to uh, simply uh, run away and the baryons were left behind as imprint of those primordial fluctuations. And this is uh, what defines a stagnant ruler. As the universe expanded with time, this fluctuation uh, expanded with the expansion of the universe. So when we measure the uh, correlation function of galaxies, we see this tiny blip in the correlation function in a, a certain distance, ab about 100 uh, megaparsecs. And by measuring that across several redshift bins, we can do uh, cosmic tomography. Now Euclid is going to um, measure this correlation function with such precise um, uh, measurements. So the uncertainties are going to be shrunk enough in order to uh, exclude the majority of cosmological models that could fit our data. As we see here, one of the, probably the, the first example uh, by SDSS. Now, the second thing we're going to, to aim to do with Euclid is um, weak gravitational lensing, cosmic shear analysis. And here, what we are after is the distortion of shapes of galaxies as the light passes through the intervening matter. You know very well that uh, matter curves space time, and as light propagates from far away galaxies towards us, it follows the geodesic, and we're going to see some very, very slight distortions, uh, which is what is supposed to be depicted in this image. Of course, this is going to be a very small effect. And in order to have something that is measurable, we need a very large sample of galaxies uh, that is going to have also a extremely sharp images, but also very accurate distances of the galaxies, which in our case is going to be photometric redshifts, and a very accurate uh, understanding of the response of the instrument, which uh, we also might call the, the point spread function. Now, a clumpier universe would lead to the cosmological parameters moving that direction. Uh, and this um, is what we're trying to pinpoint with Euclid. We try to shrink the uncertainties uh, in, in, uh, in a way that hasn't been done uh, before. My contribution in the cosmology part comes through the photometric redshift uh, and the classification working group I will discuss later on and has to do with the weak lensing analysis of the sample and it is in the early stages of the data preparation before the weak lensing. Now, of course, uh, we're going to have uh, such an impeccable data set and as history has shown with SDSS and other surveys, we are going to have so much exciting science coming out for free uh, that is not cosmology uh, related. For me personally, this has to do with active galactic nuclei and I'm sure everybody in the audience knows where, what an active galactic nucleus is. And of course, galaxies consist of very few components, right? Dark matter, uh, gas, dust, and stars. But the most important part for me is the supermassive black hole in the center of that galaxy and the material that surrounds the black hole. Of course, we cannot see the black hole directly. Uh, but we do see uh, a lot of interesting physics, the, the entire laboratory that happens uh, around the black hole. So of course, you know, there is the, the accretion disk, the broad line region, which are clouds of gas rotating very fast. Uh, the narrow line region, which are other clouds of gas a bit further out, but rotate a bit uh, less fast. And then all of this is surrounded by a dusty torus. Um, so this entire complex, whenever it's visible, whenever we have matter accreting onto the black hole, we call that collectively an, an AGM. For some special cases of, of galaxies, of course, you will have a, a radio jet, but these are something like 10% of the AGMs, and I will not uh, discuss them later on uh, in this talk. Now, why are they so important? Why are we then interested in them? Right? So the, the story is that supermassive black holes are found dormant in the centers of, of normal galaxies. And now we believe that almost all galaxies are going to have a supermassive black hole in their center. And this is spectacular, right? We only see active galaxies being less than a few percent of the galaxy population, but in all of the galaxies are going to have a supermassive black hole in their center. Uh, another very interesting correlation is the, the relationship between the mass of the bulge and the stars of a galaxy and the velocity, uh, the, the, the mass of the black hole inside your, the galaxy and the velocity dispersion 
of the stars in the same galaxy. And this relationship holds over many orders of magnitude uh, with many different kinds of, of galaxies. Theoretically, it has been shown that the black hole has enough energy through the gravitational potential to um, influence the formation of new stars, to influence the, the, the environment much further out from the vicinity of the black hole. So this makes it uh, extremely interesting um, to understand why the two would be connected. Through um, numerical simulations, on the other hand, people have shown uh, since uh, almost 20 years now that it is impossible to recreate the normal galaxy population. And this is demonstrated here by the luminosity function, which is the number density of galaxies as a function of luminosity. It is impossible to recreate normal galaxies unless some sort of energetic feedback is put back into the system to quench the formation of new stars. And this is shown here. The dust line um, shows the simulation without any energetic feedback, which means that we would have overpredicted the number of very bright galaxies in the universe by a very large amount. This is two orders of magnitude. Okay. So the solution here was to simply inject some energy, which we call agent feedback, because that is the only source that could provide so much energy. And this seems to solve the problem. We can um, recreate the galaxy population. However, if we look at the AGMs that people include in their simulation, this sort of energetic feedback, what they create is a new overprediction of what we actually see in the universe. And in this plot, you see the, the opposite. You see the luminosity function of AGM, the function of luminosity for two epochs, for two relative bins. All of the colored lines are the current state of the art simulations. And the gray and black lines are estimations of the luminosity function of AGN from data. So it's absolutely clear that the models cannot really reproduce the AGN population, even though the energetic feedback is absolutely necessary for the galaxy population. Now, all of this together, of course, makes a very exciting uh, research field. And the question still remains, is an AGN an evolutionary phase of every galaxy since we see a black hole in every galaxy? My take on this uh, problem is that we need to create a census of the AGN population in order to create a complete model. And the motivation behind the census is the following. Detecting AGN is extremely difficult. In detecting a complete AGN sample is rather impossible at the moment. We know from observations that, uh, and from the, the, the depiction we have of how the central engine of the AGN looks like, we know that it, according to the wavelength we are using to select our AGNs, we are going to end up with a different population of galaxies. And here it does have a gallery of how um, AGN tend to look like, or their selection criteria look like uh, across the wavelengths with a radio on the top, mostly picking up sources with very impressive radio jets. In the X-rays, most of the sources we're going to observe are AGN. That's why people tend to like this selection a lot. And it is also my, my favorite. And then if we look in the optical, we tend to pick up the broad and narrow line regions I, I discussed earlier, the, the clouds. Um, and here we need to have some uh, clever selection between the star forming population and the AGN population. While in, if we look in the mid infrared, we are going to pick up the sources that have the infrared torus, the dusty torus shining uh, through. You will see that the, the surface density now, not the, the number density, the surface density is going to vary significantly across the wavelengths, and this creates a, a significant problem. And furthermore, by comparing these methods, we end up with uh, samples that are not um, exactly compatible. So here I have uh, a few selections to compare. Uh, the green and orange come from the infrared. Uh, if you know the, the references, they are there, there for you. If you don't, it doesn't really matter. The, the details don't really matter. And here we are comparing three infrared selections. And in fact, except one, which is the most uh, conservative one, uh, they tend to disagree quite a bit. If we add X-rays in the mix, and now we are looking at a different part of the AGN by probing X-rays and infrared, we end up with a much larger discrepancy. 
And if we include machine learning into the game, where now we use um, a much more extended wavelength range to select our AGNs, uh, we introduce another uh, level of complication in selecting our AGN population. And this is uh, one of the motivations behind um, our SV program with uh, Dave Alexander to follow up uh, something like 2000 infrared selected sources uh, with WEAVE. Uh, uh, a new instrument that is coming up in the next months. Hopefully we will have first light in September in our observations, hopefully in October. Now this, this poses a few interesting uh, problems and, and, and challenges, right? Uh, when I discuss the AGN structure, I, I discuss something very static. So the idea is that the different uh, kinds of AGN that we see, if it's going to be um, an obscured and an unobscured AGN uh, was interpreted as differences in orientation of this system. I right? think obscured source is a source that is seen edge on, unobscured is a source that is seen uh, face on. And of course, we need to put in the mix the galaxy and the luminosity of the source. And here in these four panels, what we show is that the AGN dominance increases on the right hand side and the obscuration increases towards the top. The gray line shows the host galaxy that is always there. Um, the red line shows the AGN torus. The dark blue shows the emission lines coming from the disk and the, the, uh, the broad and narrow line region. And then we have the X-ray gas and plus uh, some hot gas from uh, binaries or some hot gas that exists in the galaxy. And you see by tweaking the parameters between obscuration and aging dominance, we can recreate a plethora of uh, signatures that we might observe and in, the, in the universe. And indeed we see possibly uh, all kinds of combinations. So we have all ratios between uh, galaxy and uh, uh, almost 100% AGN that outshines the rest of the galaxy. This figure, however, does not include the dynamical part right, in the phase, uh, in the lifetime of an AGN. Of course, the orientation is going to set the stage and you will have obscuration due to the orientation to, to some effect. However, nowadays we believe that this feedback is happening through um, winds that are launched through, through the black hole or the, in the vicinity of the black hole. And this creates the evolution, right? This uh, creates the self-regulation between the black hole and the galaxy. And of course, the, the host galaxy itself is going to have an impact. The type of the galaxy uh, will um, um, regulate how much gas that is available uh, in the reservoir in order to feed the black hole and form new stars uh, at the same time, or the large scale structure where the galaxy is embedded. On top of that, we start to have some evidences of uh, some AGN being in fact different compared to uh, the rest and not following the unified model of the orientation that uh, I described in the very simple cartoon. For example, here I, I show one of the most recent works. Of course, this has been discussed uh, in the past uh, through other incarnations of the, the same idea. Um, in this recent work, uh, what we found was that uh, red quasars, which are sources that have broad lines in their spectra, so they should have been seen uh, face on, and they have a very red continuum emission, which means they have a lot of obscuration at the same time, tend to have a lot more radio detection than blue quasars. And this does not correspond to the unified model in any way. There is no way to, to um, explain away this phenomenon through the unified model. Now, the idea here is that when galaxies would merge, they would create a starburst, and this starburst would lead first to a short phase of the red quasar, where uh, young radio jets are created and strong winds push out the dusty material, and then you end up with a blue quasar that has evolved jets and uh, weaker winds, and eventually you end up with a dormant galaxy. Uh, People in the literature have often used uh, K-band selection criteria, so near infrared selection or mid infrared selection criteria to find these sources. While in this work uh, that I described here by Clint et al, um, the authors used um, selection from uh, SDSS. Now, Euclid, remember, is going to be a near, near infrared uh, space telescope. 
which uh, creates a lot of opportunities, in, particularly for these um, obscured sources. Now, the current samples are in the order of hundreds, uh, a few hundreds, uh, let's say. However, Euclid is going to be uh, so spectacular in its capabilities that it's going to create unprecedented samples. And I try to, to show this with, with this plot here, where I show the depth uh, of the surveys on the y-axis, going from very bright surveys to very faint surveys, um, and the area on the sky that is being covered uh, on the x-axis. I'm sure you must have heard about TUMAS. This is the near-infrared survey that uh, has all sky observations. And then you have the deeper um, observations by the VISTA, uh, ESO telescope, and UKIDS. However, Euclid is going to be so much deeper and so much wider than anything else that simply blows out of the water any previous data set. And in fact, the resolution of Euclid is going to be 17 times higher than TUMAS. So we have a lot of opportunities here to really explore the red quasar population um, to, to uh, great uh, details. What Euclid will also offer us due to its uh, near infrared uh, filters is the possibility to expand the parameter space of red quasars. What I show here is the expected um, parameter space. I'm not showing the numbers here. I have calculated the numbers, but I'm not showing them in this plot just yet. We'll have to wait for the paper for that. Uh, what I'm showing here is the bolometric luminosity as a function of redshift. The black line shows the knee of the luminosity function of, of Glickman 2018 that it was uh, specifically calculated for red quasars. The different colors correspond to the EB minus V of the source, so the absorption of the source in the continuum. And you see um, up to which redshift and up to what luminosity a red quasar would be detectable with Euclid based simply on the, uh, the depth of the survey. So the, the first panel corresponds to the currently available Vista Viking survey. This is 1,300 square degrees. And if we move to the wide survey of Euclid and we uh, consider 14,500 square degrees to the depth of Euclid of 24.5, which by the way, this is a conservative depth. We can go much deeper than that. You see that we probe um, the, the knee of the luminosity function up to very high red shifts and, uh, or we can probe, we have the possibility um, and a much more a wide range of extinctions. While if we consider the very deep survey of Euclid of about 50 to 60 square degrees at greater depths, then we are able to, to, to have a much um, wider parameter space to explore. So what I, I'm currently looking into is the, the numbers we would expect from these kinds of surveys and trying to create new selection criteria for Euclid as we're not going to have K band available um, with this telescope, but we're going to have the J and H bands. Now, moving beyond uh, red quasars and talking more about the classification, uh, the work we have been doing. Um, I, this is, of course, the, the group I have been working with. I've been very fortunate to, to have my first group here in Bristol, and it's uh, quite exciting uh, because we are an interdisciplinary group where I'm working also with computer scientists, and, and this is uh, very interesting, the, the methods we are trying to, to calculate to, or to, to create. So the name of the group is Data Intensive Astronomical Analysis, of course, uh, Diana for short. And the idea is, um, of course, to study the AGN evolution and the coevolution with galaxies and exploit large area surveys. Since I am motivated by uh, Euclid, uh, both the core and the legacy goals of Euclid. In the process, we like to take advantage of machine learning and AI and develop new cool methods because we get quite excited by stuff like that. Now we have explored a range of methods in, um, uh, with my students and I will touch very briefly upon all of them here. Uh, this is just the summary so you can uh, guide yourself while I, I present the individual methods. We have uh, looked into supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, and uh, lately we're looking into simulation based inference. And the last one is more to speed up traditional uh, computation rather than uh, machine learning in a traditional sense. And uh, what we're interested in is to classify objects 
uh, meaning every object on the sky. We try to understand if it's a star, if it's a galaxy, what kind of galaxy, if it's an AGN or a quasar. And ideally, we want to identify uh, stuff like globular clusters or anything else that could exist in the data set. The story really started for me um, in Geneva when I uh, joined the collaboration uh, there with uh, Stefan Paltani. Uh, we started working on this method on exploiting extragalactic surveys in an optimal way. The motivation there was to create um, a method that will provide optimal photometric redshifts for the entire survey without the need uh, of X-ray information. So we came up with a method that is a hybrid between machine learning and model fitting. And the idea is the following. We collect first all of our data and we create all combinations of uh, the, uh, the filters that we have with creating colors. We can add extra morphological information or even optionally, we can add uh, information from the SED model through the chi-square analysis. And we create three distinct classifiers. So the first classifier answers the question, is it a star or not? The second classifier answers the question, which galaxy um, type is going to give me the optimal photometric redshift solution? And the third classifier answers the question, is the photometric redshift wrong or not? Um, and finally, since we are creating probabilistic classifiers, uh, we can consolidate all of the probability thresholds we apply and tune the sample according to the science gates. For example, if we want a more pure star sample or a more pure galaxy sample or a very accurate uh, sample, we can reject uh, quite aggressively on the outliers. To do this, uh, we used uh, 50,000 sources that have spectroscopy and 200 input features that were created by combining 12 unique photometric bands. Uh, I just list the bands for those of you in the audience that are familiar with this kind of data uh, for your uh, uh, information. And what we uh, do here with our supervised learning, we're using random forest for this analysis. We assign labels from the uh, best photometric receipt model per source. This is the result of the classifier. This is a color plot uh, that looks very similar to uh, the BZK analysis. This is not, instead of the B is the, the G band because we don't have B in this data set. And in the color bar, you see the different classes as you would expect them on the BZK plot, right? The black uh, sources are the stars, the quasars are on this side and the passive sources as uh, you would expect from BZK are on this side. Now, random forest gives us the most important features of the classifier. And this is what I used here um, to create this projection of the parameter space. And indeed, it seems that the separation of the quasars in this space is much more neat compared to the BZK analysis. So this plot has become my favorite and you will see it um, a lot later on in pretty much all of the work I do. This is the first plot I look at. Now, by combining all of this uh, information of the classification, we can use a reduced template set uh, for photometric redshift estimation. And I will show you the details in the next slide. What I want to show you immediately is that the result of the photometric redshift is absolutely exceptional for this kind of data. And we end up uh, recreating the N of Z of the population quite accurately. Now let's move into a little bit more detail of its classifier. So we are in classifier A, where we are looking into stars. Uh, here, classifying stars in this situation is rather easy, if I could say. Uh, what I have here is a different combination of uh, photometric selection. Uh, for example, running through the filters between U and K, or including um, in mid-infrared data, uh, Ys in this case, or UV, or including absolutely everything. Uh, we have absolutely exceptional results for all possible combination. So this gives me great uh, satisfaction. We can uh, identify stars uh, very easily. And here you have the, the quality, which is completeness with the, the dotted curve and purity with the solid curve. And we are um, at very high, uh, very high levels, regardless of the threshold probability we, we might decide to choose. Typically for a binary classifier, that would be at 50%. Now let's move into the more difficult stuff. Stars are easy, galaxies not so much. 
Um, these are the models I have used for the five different libraries, going from the FASI, the star forming, the starburst, the AGN that are a mixed bag of things, and the quasars. Uh, QSO2 doesn't mean that it's a, an obscured quasar, it means the second category. Here, I, um, I went through many different combinations of um, or organizing the templates uh, by keeping all of the models and allowing the chi-square to pick the best model um, and going down progressively to purer and purer um, separation of the populations. This is the result of the photometric redshift analysis. And you see that if we take the simplest case where we take all of the models together and simply use chi-square, we have the worst performing result. This is something we have known uh, from the work uh, done by Mara. And moving down to the first uh, slot, which is equivalent to what was done in Cosmos using X-ray information, we already improved the results significantly. And uh, I have shown that if we go uh, two steps further down where we have very pure selection of galaxies separating between the passive star forming and the extreme star forming, we're able to decrease the number of outliers even further. So if you ask, depending on who you ask, if you ask me, I prefer to have less outliers and a bit uh, larger uh, spread on the accuracy, which is the, the spread uh, you see on this plot, while the outliers are the sources that are completely outside uh, of these red lines. We go back to my favorite plot, and I overplot uh, each galaxy category separately. You see the passive sources uh, are very well isolated. The quasars are extremely well isolated, while the AGNs and the starbursts tend to be a mixed bag of things, which is understandable. And it's also um, seen here in the confusion matrix. And it's understandable because the, the starburst and the AGN tend to look quite similar in their broadband uh, photometric colors. We have applied um, exactly the same method in the XXL survey, which is 50 square degrees uh, on the sky. And here I show, instead of the class, I show the probability for each uh, category. So here, this is classifier star, not star. Probability to be a star almost 100% for all of the sources that lie in this region. Same for the passive galaxies. Probability to be a passive galaxy almost 100% in this region. Let's skip back to the quasars that are the easy ones. Uh, we can uh, isolate the cloud of quasars very well. And then, as we can expect, the AGNs and the star forming are a lot more challenging to have a very pure result. Now, how else can we make sure that the classifier works the way we would have liked it to work? We can go back to our data set and ask further questions, especially we can add uh, information that was never included in the classifier or at any process of this work. Now, here I have the famous wise selection of AGN. This is W1 minus W2. So everything above this line is a strong candidate of being an AGN. Every source that has a color on this plot is an X-ray source. The color represents the different classes of my random forest classification. Here I've swapped the, the color bar. I apologize for that. The quasar is on the top now. It's the, the dark red and the passive is the blue. Another piece of information that we have, and that makes the fourth approach, is the squares that you see. These are all sources that have broad lines in their spectra. So this gives me great confidence that the classification works extremely well. The quasars are exactly uh, where I would expect them to be, and they all tend to be broad line sources. While we have additionally some X-ray sources that are not um, AGN, and this is also uh, expected, especially for a very large area survey such as the XXL. The great points I, I failed to mention is our, just the galaxy population uh, in the field. Now, the next step is what if we don't trust our labels? Why, what if we don't want to do any supervised learning? In this case, we go towards unsupervised learning. And the idea is that you take your parameter space and you try to find structure. You try to find clusters in that parameter space. We wanted to use HTB scan to do this clustering business. However, uh, Crispin, the, the student that has been working with me on this, found that uh, HDB scan couldn't cope with 200 dimensions. So we had to do some dimensionality reduction uh, beforehand. 
So for this work, we chose to do a principal component analysis, which is a linear uh, decomposition of the parameter space. And we created an optimized model per class. And in this uh, particular work, we kept it simple. We used only three classes, star, galaxy, and quasar. I want to, to show you immediately the results. This is the, um, the PCA space. The, we we um, projected our parameter space that was initially 200 uh, dimensions to a space that has three dimensions. So we can make three plots to visualize quite easily how the PCA space uh, looks like. And you see on the top row um, and the bottom row is, is exactly the same space. The color is different. The top shows the model that has been optimized to find quasars, which you see with blue in this cloud. And in the bottom shows the result of all three classifiers. And you can see that the quasars are here at the bottom, the galaxies are in the middle, and the stars um, are with black uh, on the top, and the other two projections of the same uh, parameter space. So even though PCA is a linear uh, decomposition of our data set, it seems that quite significant structure is preserved rather well, and we are able to identify at least these major groups of uh, sources in our data. Now we can compare this result to supervised uh, learning. First, we can compare to the automat automated labeling from the SDSS. This is if we simply download SDSS DR14 and the labels uh, from the spectroscopic analysis, we end up with a cloud that looks like that. The quasars, we expect them to be on this region, but what we notice is that there is a significant overlap of the quasar population as denoted by SDSS and the galaxy population. Now, this is a well-known artifact of SDSS. We know that the automatic pipeline is not 100% uh, accurate. And that was the point of the work of Paris et al. 2018, where a, a large part of the data has been visually assessed and it has been, um, um, cleaned, let's say, we have a much better population of quasars, and you see a lot of the sources that would overlap with the galaxy cloud are now gone. Now, this poses a significant challenge because typically people will take the SDSS labels as they are and try to do supervised learning with it. And of course, if you try to teach an algorithm to identify objects that look like that, you will get back exactly what you wished. Uh, and the answer is going to look quite similar to the original data set. With the unsupervised learning, we are able to mitigate this problem because we have one classifier per category. Whenever a source is um, selected by more than one classifiers, we call that an outlier because it's not a clear cut distinction in which category the source should belong to. And in this source, in this list of, of outliers, we are going to have some interesting sources. We are going to have some very wacky looking sources that we don't know what to do with them. Um, but we will also have some sources that rightfully so belong there, such as this guy. So this is a very high redshift quasar that you see um, the Lyman forest already, right? So in the optical part of this source, oops, the color of the galaxy look the color of the quasar starts to look like a galaxy so they would be placed on this cloud so by doing unsupervised learning and by simply looking at uh, densities in our input uh, space for us this source would not have been classified as a quasar but rightfully so uh, so there is this idea of trying to um, merging different kinds of selections and different projections of the parameter space in order to create the most optimal um, classification for your science case, but it's ultimately the science case that is going to drive the selection of the method and the interpretation of the data, even if they are outliers. This is a, a word of caution when it comes to unsupervised learning, because I see that a lot in the literature, a lot of uh, eager students take TSNE as a projection of the parameter space into two dimensions and then they try to do clustering on this parameter space. However, TSNE is not meant to be used for this, um, for this purpose. TSNE is only meant to be used as visualization and nothing more uh, than that. 
The second word of caution in this case is that the, the separation of the clusters between galaxies, stars, and quasars looks too good to be true in this parameter space using UMAP. And if it's look, it looks too good to be true, it is too good to be true. So this is a spectroscopic sample, I remind you, which means we have the most brightest sources that are available. And if we do the same projection of the parameter space with a photometric sample that contains a lot of fainter sources, we start to bridge the gap between the clusters. And sometimes UMAP is able to hallucinate clusters, as my mathematician friends like to say, um, create clusters in places where they shouldn't be. So this is the work we are still trying to, to understand uh, in detail, and that's why we haven't published quickly something on this, but it is very much uh, of interest and hopefully you will hear um, something new in this direction coming uh, very soon. Um, a couple more words in the, the last few minutes that remain on the work that my students have been doing uh, recently. Uh, the first one is active learning. So active learning, um, help us reach the accuracy we want faster with less data. It sounds, uh, it sounds like a fantastic pitch and in fact it works very well. You see here as an example if we do random forest classification using 24,000 sources and we separate between stars, galaxies and quasars, we can reach very high accuracy and very high F1 scores. As I showed earlier, this is using the same data set. However, if we do active learning using only 50 iterations, we are able to use to, to reach the same or sometimes even marginally higher uh, performance. Now, the way active learning works is you create um, a, a model, you train your random forest by picking, let's say, five random points, and then you predict on your data and find the most uncertain part of that parameter space. From that uncertain parameter space, you pick the most uncertain point, you assign a label as a human, hence the human in the loop, and then you put that back in your training sample. And by doing so iteratively, your model decides where is the most important part of the parameter space. You as the human bring back your expertise in the model and the model becomes very accurate, very fast. So Grant is one of my computer scientist students and he has published a, a dashboard in order to, to do this business of active learning. Um, with one go, you can see all the information you need. In panel A, this is where you do the training. You can have a projection of the parameter space, which you can see is my favorite plot, of course. And the black dots are the visited points, right? The, the yellow is the one that is currently queued. So what is happening is that you visualize the yellow point, you get to see extra information that is not included in the model, such as cutouts in the optical and the radio and spectra, if they are available and they're all coming directly from the web. You can visualize information from your catalog if you have um, extra uh, data there. And then you get to pick which is the label of your source. So here, most likely, I guess we all agree that this is a galaxy, so we would um, assign it a galaxy uh, label and proceed to the next step. At the bottom, we have different projections. These are all for the convenience of the users. There are different projections of the parameter space, or we can look at the SCD of the source to give us uh, some extra information for our classification. If we don't want to classify a source because it looks too strange and we don't know what it is, we can simply say it's unsure and we just put it aside and we move on to the next most, most uncertain point. I should have clicked through while saying all of that. Apologies, uh, but that's it. I welcome you to, to go and have a look at the, um, at the GitHub repo of Grant. He has very nice documentation and I'm sure you can, um, you can find your way around. The last two works I want to simply mention extremely uh, briefly because they, the papers are being wrapped up uh, currently. Uh, one is, um, classifying stars versus galaxies in this case, but the actual class you assign, it doesn't really matter. What is more interesting in this work is that we include measurement uncertainties, we create a probabilistic classifier and we treat missing data uh, with this architecture that, that Mayank put together for his master thesis. So the idea here is that we um, assign the color combinations that we create at the, for the training as part of the network. And then we put a dropout layer that 
for you that uh, know where the dropout layer is, um, usually is at the end of a network. Uh, we bring it uh, at the very early uh, steps of the network. And with a dropout network, what you do is artificially you switch off uh, some of the neurons during the training. And people do that uh, usually to not allow a model to overfit to the data, to not create, crystallize the structure of the data too rigidly. And that's why it's done at the end of the network. Instead, we want our model to be able to learn in the presence of missing data. And that's why we put this dropout layer uh, very early on in the process. Now we have seen that uh, our models, when they are in ensembles, they, they work much better. So instead of having one model like this, Mayank made a thousand that are completely independent and each model gets a vote on uh, uh, the class of the source. And by combining the 1000 votes, we can create a probability distribution uh, for the classification of the source. For the measurement our entities, we are doing that before the data are given to the, to the network. We take the simple assumption that um, the magnitude uh, is, uh, can be described by a Gaussian distribution. The measurement of the flux is the mean and the uncertainty is the, um, the width of the, the Gaussian. Mayan has explored many other uh, properties of, of the data in this work. I will not go too much into the details. One of them is masking the data in order to assess which band is more important than the others. And he found that the mid infrared bands are more important for the classification of stars. And I have here an inset to um, depict why, if we take a look at the galaxy that looks like that, uh, if we don't have the mid infrared bands, it could look almost like a star. But if we do have the mid infrared bands, we can tell that this in fact is a quasar and not a star. One last thing that it was uh, very interesting to explore uh, here was to allow the network um, to identify how to create colors. What I mean by that is that since the color combination, the color construction is part of the network, when we divide one filter from the other, we allow the weights between those two um, to be free and learn them through the training process. Interestingly enough, what Mayang found is that the optimal uh, combination of filters is in fact the subtracting one of the other as we have been doing for many hundreds of years. Now one very last thing uh, very quickly, uh, because this is still something we are developing, is um, using machine learning to help us speed up our computation. One of the very slow computation, but very interesting one, um, is SED fitting or decomposition of the SED and exploring the physical parameters. So what we do here is we have a set of uh, points and we try to explore the parameter space uh, in, in the physical parameter space to try to assess the stellar mass, the star formation rate, metallicity, and so on and so forth. Now we know that this method can be used to identify low luminosity AGN, and this is something uh, Ben uh, um, uh, did for his master thesis as well. And by using this kind of work, we would be able to expand the, the way we select AGN towards lower luminosities. However, this is completely prohibitive when we're talking about Euclid scale data, because if we take 10 minutes per galaxy, this is going to require 10 to the nine CPU hours. Uh, what Maxim did here, who is another computer science PhD student, is to take the idea um, and, and subtly change the way we approach the problem. So instead of having um, a likelihood that connects the model and the data, he has created a neural li likelihood that has already uh, encoded the connection between the physical parameters and the photometry we expect to observe. He has done that uh, using this particular architecture, uh, which is a sequential autoregressive network. So which means that we have one network Per physical parameter. The prediction is uh, practically um, a Gaussian distribution. And then what we uh, propagate to the next layer of the network is the predictions of the previous network and the input features. Again, uh, the order doesn't matter. This is something he has tested already. What we can get at the end is a much faster estimation of physical parameters. Here, what I'm showing is the example of the library. This is not based on, uh, the, on data. This is simply how well we can understand the library and map the connection between the physical parameters and the photometry. 
However, it is so much faster. It's a thousand times faster than NCMC, which makes the exploration of our data set now viable. And in fact, what we can also think about this method as is um, a way to bypass the burning time of the MCMC and just speed up MCMC. So you could imagine taking the initial parameters from this method, which is already close to the truth, and then use MCMC to fine tune the um, final SDFT. And this brings me to, to the end. So AGN selection with data intensive astronomy is becoming extremely exciting. We have a lot of data to play with, probably too much uh, data. But there is a lot to be done. We can, uh, of course, the first thing will be, of course, to understand the, the cosmological parameters. This is the whole point of the Euclid mission. But we are going to get for free an exceptional data set with uh, accuracies we could have never imagined in as a galaxy evolution uh, perspective, just because the requirements of the cosmology are, are so um, tight. What we can imagine for the AGN part is, of course, to start to think of a new model of AGN evolution. What is the role of AGN in galaxy evolution and how do black holes form and evolve? Hopefully in the future seminar, we can discuss that and, and look back and remember the days when we built all of our methods. I will stop here. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sotiria. Uh, this is a, was a very thorough and excellent talk. Uh, now, if people have questions, could you please raise your hand or uh, either electronically or turn on the camera and uh, I'll see your hand. Uh, Yasun? Yeah, hi, th thank you. That was, that was uh, good, of course, brilliant. I, maybe you, you said it and I, I just missed it, but I'm old and in, in, in all my career, everybody has always told me that the, the big problem is separating the quasars from the red stars because they look all the same. And then you show this brilliant, your favorite plot, and you go like, where's the problem? And if I want, just correct me if I'm wrong, but is it that you have spectra and that's the magic? Because otherwise I'm, I'm really feeling particularly old at this moment and your smile yeah. isn't making it any better. <laughs> No, you're absolutely right. The, the red quasar, no, the, the red stars and the quasars uh, could be an issue for Euclid, in fact, and it's one of the things we, we have to investigate uh, more. What I, I put pushed under the rug here is that in this work, we have wise data available. Once you have the mid infrared, everything is easier, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Hence the smile. The smile was for me, not for you. <laughs> Uh, okay, maybe someone else. Uh, Adoni. Hi, Sotiria. Uh, mm -hmm. Excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, my question. So, yeah, you, you you did not talk so much about how you are going to apply all these methods to the Euclid data. Uh, and one aspect of the Euclid data uh, is the images themselves. So all those methods um, are about catalogs, aren't they? Uh, catalog data, photometry and all that uh, included in a catalog. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there is a merit in the images themselves, therefore whether you can use information um, from the images, and I'm really talking about deep learning here and convolutional networks, it's, and whether some of that classification or photometric redshift or, um, well, the classification problems really that you mentioned can be improved by that. Uh, yes, hi, <laughs> the, of course. There are two answers to that. Uh, people are exploring that in the collaboration uh, and it seems to bring uh, some improvement. Uh, the motivation of my approach here comes really from the requirements of the cosmology and the cosmologies do not allow us to use any morphological information because that would bias the cosmology. So from my perspective, I have to work with the catalogs. On the other hand, depending on what you do is not such a bad thing, right? We need to keep in mind the scale of the Euclid data set. The images are going to be petabytes. 
I'm not sure nobody wants to do that, right? <laughs> to, to use petabytes of images to classify okay. sources, because with the catalogs, we can do that already to, to the requirement, right? This is, this is the, the goal. Um, so the answer is yes and no, <laughs> right? There is merit in doing it depending on what you're after, but it's not probably um, the first thing you should try. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Having said yeah. that, we are doing work on the morphological and, uh, analysis of the sources just to get the morphology of the sources. Oh, okay. Right. I'm just, the reason I mentioned images is the following, really. You know, like the, with the photometry, as you know better than I, uh, than me, um, there are many ways to do photometry. And depending on the way you do the photometry, you know, you for certain types of sources, I think I, at least you can get very different results. But the image is the, is the basic information, right? You have all the information there. And, uh, um, and therefore you don't rely on intermediate steps really of deriving information from that image. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, I think it always goes back to the idea of what is exactly the question you're trying to ask. Because when we did this experiment many years ago in Geneva with a summer student, um, we tried to derive photometric redshifts using the images directly. And what he got as an answer mm -hmm. was that uh, using the very center of the image would give him the best result also by including the entire image which is equivalent using aperture photometry at the end. So we are getting back the, the result that we knew uh, all along. But if you're after okay. uh, some other kind of classification that includes the morphology of the source, if you want to separate between uh, quasars and AGN, for example, you might mm -hmm. consider that. However, quasars are so distinct in their colors mm. that you don't necessarily need the image. Maybe you want to, to to distinguish between type one and type two AGN. And there you want to see the really the thick picked center of the AGN on your image. And yeah, we, we do plan to, to work on, on stuff like that, but it's not, uh, we're not there yet. Okay, great, good stuff. Since I, I don't see another hand, maybe I will sort of like follow up to the question that uh, uh, Adonis raised. In, or a similar one, uh, you, you, you very well know that uh, if we try to identify the presence of an AGN in the near infrared, we are often very much affected by the bounds of the galaxy, even when we do observation with larger telescopes than uh, uh, Euclid, right, from the ground. So uh, I, I know that uh, reading actually, right, I'm not working in the field that uh, there is uh, the stability of the PSF uh, of uh, Euclid is exceptional. And uh, also there is substantial work uh, that has been done in order to like map it and model it so that you will do all the uh, gravitational weak lensing experiments that uh, people need to do. And this is crucial, right? So, but when, uh, because you mentioned it, when you will uh, uh, use the pipeline which will produce the photometry, uh, of your nuclear regions, right? Hoping to identify or sort of like guesstimate the AGN contribution to your uh, near infrared, et cetera. Do you think that, uh, have you thought about that? W what limitations there might be or would you always need based on the work that you've done so far, need infrared data uh, where the resolution would be substantially worse, right? Yeah. Further, I mean, would you need would you need to have, for example, wise uh, twelve micron images, or uh, to do it, or uh, would you need uh, if you have the four point four and a half micron images, would it be enough? Yeah. How how but, far in the far infrared in the mid infrared do you need to go in order to bootstrap your methods? Yeah, yeah. So of course, these are stuff we're still exploring, right? I don't have the exact answer, but I can tell you based on the feeling I have on these kind of explorations we have done, which are still from the ground. So we have not reached to the extreme level of accuracy we will have with Euclid as yet. Um, 
and of course here I, I didn't uh, I mentioned it in passing but I didn't of course um, pointed out so much that Euclid is not going to be just Euclid we will combine our data set with optical from the ground of course right otherwise uh, we are all doomed <laughs> uh, I mean it's it's how we we usually work in uh, multi-wavelength surveys as you know very well now for the mid infrared in particular uh, this is an investigation we're still carrying out, uh, in fact, to see what is the level that we need the mid infrared support. Uh, but I do have the answer already between 4.5 and 12 microns. We don't need to go to 12 microns from what I can see now. Uh, w1 and W2, which is 3.6 and 4.5, should already be very helpful. I cannot tell you up to what luminosity sadly does yet. But uh, the bulk of the population, or at least the, the bright quasars, seem to be um, identified rather well already. That's and cool. in fact, that's how I would use WISE um, in this kind of analysis, right? To, because WISE is very shallow, as, as you very well know, but it will help us to at least pick up the brightest sources and the most problematic ones potentially for the cosmology. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sophia. Um, I don't see any other hand raised. Uh, if there isn't, I would like to thank you on behalf of all of us, Sotiria, for taking the time to give us this excellent uh, colloquium. And uh, let's all meet again once more next month for the last uh, colloquium of uh, this year. Thank you very much, Sotiria. Thank you. Bye-bye.